four people, including myself. So, so uh, all right, so, so I, I'm a hundred percent trusting uh, Abdu at the the helm of managing everything. So my job, I'm going to, you know, talk about the topic white privilege and racism. And I have a little uh, disclaimer here. I'm really not a race scholar, and my research interest primarily is in immigration history, especially the history of Chinese immigration. So what got me interested, interested in um, racism and later white privilege was uh, from teaching the course of sociology of racial and cultural groups that I really explore a lot of these concepts. Uh, so when I looked at my teaching career, I have been teaching at Caldwell for 22 years. And when I start teaching this course, I, because of my specialty in immigration, I usually you know, like rely on the history of immigration to talk about the race relations of different groups. And um, my students, I have to thank all my students who really uh, helped me learn about the history, this racialized history in the United States and how to understand racism and white privilege. And I special thanks go to my good friend of almost 30 years and who is black and continues to engage me, debate me to talk about this and help me understand uh, my students and my good friends. All of them help me understand uh, you know, the importance of understanding uh, white privilege and racism with their lived experience. So I want to give them a huge shout out. So tonight, and I'm not lecturing, I call it presentation. And basically I want to invite you to come into my world of trying to learn about this racialized history and try to tackle this issue of white privilege and racism. So tonight is going to be my reflection on my learning and my growth. And I invite you to come back and talk with me and share with me your ideas. Okay, so let's go. So what is privilege? So privilege, according to this anti-racism scholar, Peggy McIntosh. So she defines privilege as unearned advantages and that are highly valued. So these advantages are very valuable yet restricted to certain groups of people. So she wrote this short essay that um, I sent to uh, Abdu and I invite you guys to read. It was very short, like uh, two pages. And in that essay, she uh, entitled White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. In that short essay, she listed 50 effects of white privilege. And I just picked out two of them. And one of them is that I can go shopping alone and pretty sure that I will not be followed or harassed because McIntosh is a white woman. Another uh, one that I picked out is that I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. And I also learned this from my good friend who married a Japanese American. They have a beautiful mixed race daughter, live in a progressive community in Washington, DC. Yet constantly he and his wife have to talk to their daughter about how to deal with systemic racism in school. So that is privilege. Now privilege also oppresses certain groups of people. When I was teaching sociological theory, my students and I, we read um, W.E.B. Du Bois' book entitled The Souls of Black Folk. In this book, du, du Bois speaks of this, a peculiar sensation of two-ness experienced by African-Americans because of the racialized oppression in a white dominated society. And he called this quote unquote double consciousness. 
So here I want to quote his writing about the stubble consciousness. One ever few feels his trueness, an American, unequal, two souls, two thoughts, two reconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose darkest strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Very powerful writing in the beginning of the 20th century, talking about this oppression experienced by generations of Black Americans. So I have a couple of questions for you to think about uh, now. And when we return, we can talk about some of these questions because I did open this conversation with my students. Some of my students said that, oh, there was pre-civil rights movements. Now everything is getting better. So my questions to you are, do black people still experience this double consciousness today? Is it still, is it still relevant? What other groups of people may also experience this double consciousness that Du Bois talked about? So think about that. So let me go into um, white privilege. The privilege that McIntosh describes and the privilege mm -hmm. made Du Bois feel this peculiar sense of double consciousness is what we call the white privilege. But what is white privilege? Another uh, scholar, a uh, race scholar, David Wellman, defined white privilege as, quotes, a system of advantage based on race, taken for granted by whites and that cannot be enjoyed by people of color in the same context. So here are the examples that he came up with. For example, in school, in the government, in community, in the workplace. So. When I'm teaching this course, when I'm talking about going through this journey of learning about um, racism, this racialized history, and again and again, my friend James and I talk about all these issues and he helped me understand as a black young man, he was questioned about his qualification of becoming a PhD student, the only black a scholar in the electrical engineering school, right? Constantly he had to defend himself and saying that I got here with my own merits. So I gave you this example here because when I teach this course, I like to show my students picture. So this is a picture that I found right on the internet. And white privilege is that when someone got into an elite school, right? They don't have to worry about being questioned. How did they get there? Is it because of the affirmative action, right? And oftentimes affirmative action is being interpreted as the quota, you part of the quota, right? And my friend James had to go, to go through two schools, two programs to get his PhD in electrical engineering, just because he is black. I also want to, want to introduce to you uh, another race scholar, Cheryl Harris, how she described uh, white privilege. And she described white privilege or being white as a property, as a position of status, right? And this position of status really help people to gain that identity, to be perceived as white. So then they get the, they receive the privilege. They receive the entitlement, right? Sorry, I lost my page here. So when we think about this whiteness as a position of status, I can think of a couple of examples. First, 
it's really a privilege to be perceived as white. Just to think about, right, in early immigration history, that Irish, Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants, they were not treated as white. And they are only treated as white today because they had been whitened or assimilated into the white culture, right? Another example, right? This case in 1922 that happened to this Japanese American. This Japanese immigrant was born, um, his name of Ozawa, Ozawa versus United States, right? He was born in Japan, migrated to Hawaii, lived in Hawaii, and later I believe he lived in California for 20 years, had children, lived in the community, attended a local community church. So he figured he wanted to become a US citizen, right? But his application was denied and was ruled by Supreme Court that he could not become a citizen, regardless how long he has been a resident. And the only reason was that he was not quote unquote perceived white. So being white, you have the entitlement to become a citizen in order to receive the benefits of a citizen, right? Other examples that still happen today to a lot of the people of color, which is very important, the voting rights, right? Even today, the this election season, right? My daughter and I were just talking about how nervous we are, right? Who can vote? Who cannot vote? Whose votes count, right? So a couple of examples here. Now, Black Americans were given, were granted citizenship in 1868, right? After the emancipation in 1865. But not until 1965, almost a hundred years later, right? More than hundred, yeah, almost a hundred years later that they finally got the right to vote. Still, they could not vote because they had to, they had to pay, to pay the poll taxes, right? And so then now there are also other intimidation, voter suppression that they still could not vote. Even today, if you committed a felt, uh, 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 you know, um, a, a se se uh, severe crime, right? Uh, if you were felony, right? And then after after you uh, serve your sentence, and you still have to pay fees, otherwise you cannot vote. So all these barriers, right? And sound really reasonable, but they become this invisible barriers for people of color to advance, to even to exercise their citizenship rights, right? Other people, for example, Chinese Americans, right? Started coming to the United States in the middle of the 19th century, but they were not allowed to vote until 1943. What about Native Americans? They were the indigenous people, right? People of the land. They were not given the right to vote until 1948. What about Latino people, right? They were not allowed to vote until 1965. Even that, only the quote unquote English speaking Latinos were allowed to vote. And the Spanish speaking Latinos were not allowed to vote until 1975. So think about all these, right? And they all sound very reasonable written to the law. You have to be, you have to pass a literacy test. You have to know English, right? You have to, you have to uh, pay, be able to pay taxes. All these are built into the system. That's what sociologists call it, structural discrimination, structural racism, systemic racism that we will talk about later. Now, why is it useful to analyze this whiteness as a position of status? Because identity 
and perceptions of identity can grant or deny resources and a sense of entitlement that we talked about earlier, right? Or lack of entitlement to resources. And one example, when I was doing my research, right? And this scholar, um, Robin D'Angelo brought up this example of Jackie Robinson. And I checked it out, I said, what she writes, right? And I saw it in Wikipedia. This was the one line that I quoted here. Jackie Robinson broke the baseball color line when he started at first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers on April 15, 1947. What's wrong with this statement, right? And D'Angelo argued that there's a lot of things wrong with this statement, right? It's wrong, the statement is wrong because if Jackie Robinson was a white man, right? As long as he was good enough, he should be able to make it to play in the major league baseball, but because he was black, right? So this is, you know, like he was so good that they could not refute him. So it's like, oh, that's great that he's good enough. He's a special black man, so we can let him play, right? That's the, he did not have the entitlement, no, regardless how good he was. So that's something that we really need to think about, the privilege granted to people that without any effort on their, on their part, that is why privilege. So being white, meaning you have, you are granted the privilege that other people may not have. And it's very important that this privilege becomes a asset for you to succeed in the society because you are the, you are the insider now. You have a sense of belonging, you belong to the society. And this position automatically confers these unearned advantages, right? You have all the green lights turned on for you because whites control all major institutions and set the policies and practices that other, other people must live by. If you don't believe me, let's take a look at some examples. According to the New York Times survey in 2016, right, they listed many, many, um, you know, statistics that how the whites dominates pretty much all aspects of the American society, right? So let's look at some of the really important institutions. 10 richest Americans, 100% white. What about US Congress? This was, remember, 2016, right? U.S. Congress, 90% white. What about the military? We know a lot of people of color serve in the military, but we are not talking about that. We're talking about the top military advisors, 100% white. What about we watch TV, right? People who decide which TV show that we can see 93% white. What about news? Because nowadays, you know, I'm a news junkie because I'm a sociologist, right? But who decides which news that we, which news to cover? 85% white. Now you understand that I don't just listen to the American news. I check out the Canadian CBC News. I check out the British BBC News. And I check out the South China Morning Post, right? Because, you know, I know that, you know, people of color, Chinese people, if I want to learn something about my native uh, cultures, I have to get outside of this white culture because 85% of the news producers and people at the top to decide what news to cover are white. 
What about people who decide which music to produce? 95% white. Now I understand why I oftentimes hear that kind of music, right? And what about teachers, right? This is we're talking about K to 12, 82% white. What about college professors, colleagues? Let's take a look at that. That's about us, 84% white. So what this New York Times survey shows that whites pretty much dominate the structure, the institutions of this society. That's why it's very important to understand white privilege because we live in a white dominated society. I love reading Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility. So if you guys want to read it, it's, it's a very powerful book, right? This is what she writes about. To, she writes, quote, to recognize white privilege is to understand racism as a network of norms and actions that consistently create advantage for whites and disadvantage for people of color. These norms and act actions include basic rights and benefits of the doubt. So I highlight these because I will elaborate a little bit in the following slides. Now, these basic rights and benefits of the doubt supposedly granted to all people, but in actuality, only consistently afforded to white people. So let me explain. So think about when you go to, um, you know, like to find some hair product, shampoo, conditioner, hair dye. Um, like if you're like me, I use hair dye to be honest, right? But you know, if I have trouble finding the hair dye that fits my color, hair color and my skin color, because when I walk into a store, right? Hair color, hair care, basically, you know, they are, they're being uh, stocked or shelved in the big aisle. And a small aisle, you will find ethnic hair products, right? So I ended up going to local China, uh, Asian fruit market to get my own hair products. Another example is grocery, right? I cook this mixed Asian, Italian, American, you name it, right? Everything I just sprinkle with some soy sauce, I'm good to go, right? But it's hard for me to find um, the traditional, um, you know, ingredients that I need for, for my own cooking. Because when I go to local shop rights, I will see that uh, most of the food uh, stock in the store are for pretty much white people. And then there is, if I want my, um, my sesame oil, my soy sauce, and I have to go to ethnic food aisle, right? So again, it really shows that white is the norm. That's what we see in, in our community, no matter how diverse our community is. And that's what we see that white, whiteness still uh, becomes the norm of our society in our daily life that we, uh, we, we, we live. Uh, another way to look at white privilege is that being white has the power of the benefit of the doubt. So when you think about it, white people are more likely to see positive portrayals of people who look like them on the news, on TV shows, and in movies. And you, when you think about it, this positive image, how often do Black people, Latino people, Asians, Native Americans that you can see, right? And I remember some of my friends told me that, my white friends told me that, I love the crazy uh, rich Asians. I said, oh my God, Asians are not crazy. It, not all Asians are rich, right? Because it's very hard to see the positive images about Asians, about Latinos, about Blacks, not that many, right? And white people are generally assumed to be low uh, law-abiding 
uh, citizens until they show that they're not. On the contrary, people of color, in particular, Blacks and Latinos are routinely assumed to be criminal or potential criminals until they show that they are not. And I, on my way home from uh, Caldwell this afternoon, I just heard this horrible story that happened in New York City that happened to this uh, Latino family that they, it was a misidentity, but ICE uh, disguised themselves as NYPD officer, knock on the door of, a, of an immigrant, Latino immigrant, right? Pretended that they were police, right? So they didn't know the, the difference between NYPD and, and, and police in general, right? Now, arrested her husband because they found that there was a minor violation. Now he is in the ICE custody, right? So oftentimes that misidentity or not misidentity, Latinos are and Blacks oftentimes are presumed to be guilty until they prove themselves otherwise, right? Now whites will get very different treatment. I'm not going, there are many, many stories that since the summer, the killing of George Floyd, we've seen a lot of those incidents, but I want to show you another side of this, you know, power of the benefit of the doubt. So before I show you this video, I want to give you a little background. I don't know whether you are aware there was a story that's actually a sexual assault case that happened in California. What happened was that this uh, white college students in Stanford in 2015, he sexually assaulted a young woman outside a party house. He was, you know, uh, controlled by two international students. They called the police, they arrested him, and he was convicted of committing that crime. However, ironically, he received very light sentence. So this is a very three minutes YouTube video uh, story about the judge's sentencing. So I'm gonna show you this and then I'm gonna come back. So now Abdu, I need your help to make sure that I, I do, I can do the, um, I can share the video. Where did it go? Oh, I have to stop this one. There, I found it. Perfect. Oh, hold on. New follow. Hold on. Did I share the? Can you hear the sound? Oh, good. Okay. New fallout over the judge who issued a controversial ruling in the Stanford sexual assault case. Judge Aaron Persky was blocked from presiding over a new sexual assault hearing involving an unconscious woman. In a statement, the district attorney said, quote, after the recent turn of events, we lack confidence that Judge Persky can fairly participate in this upcoming hearing. Critics say that the judge's six-month sentence of former Stanford swimmer Brock Turner was too light. John Blackstone is at the courthouse in Palo Alto, California, near the Stanford campus, with sharp new criticism of the judge. John, good morning. Good morning. A local paper here published a letter from a juror who served on the Turner case under Judge Persky. In that letter, he says he was shocked and appalled by Turner's minimal sentence. The unnamed juror called Persky's sentence ridiculously lenient, saying it makes a mockery of the entire trial. Brock Turner's sentence, which could amount to as little as three months in county jail with good behavior, left one juror so angry he wrote to the judge. In a letter obtained by the Palo Alto Weekly, he writes, you choose to disregard the jury's findings and believe the defendant's self-serving version of events. In a newly released sentencing document, Judge Persky pointed to Turner's age, lack of criminal history, intoxication, and character letters on his behalf as factors in his decision. He said a prison sentence would have a severe impact on him, but the juror fired back isn't that the point? A sentence should have a severe impact on Mr. Turner. Retired Judge LaDoris Cordell presided over Santa Clara County Superior Court for almost 19 years. Have you ever seen a letter like this one? I have not. They unanimously agreed that he had committed these acts. And the feeling of this juror was that the sentence did not reflect the verdict that they brought back. 
On Friday, women's rights advocates calling for Persky's removal delivered nearly a million signatures to the state commission on judicial performance. Vice President Biden, who wrote an open letter to the victim last week, again addressed the issue Tuesday. If you cannot consent because you are unconscious, it is rape. It is rape, period. When sentencing Turner, the judge said the media attention has not only impacted the victim, but also Mr. Turner. The evidence of his character up until the night of this incident has been positive. When he said, all right, these are mitigating factors, these were basically code for white privilege. What about the person that isn't enrolled in, in a prestigious school that doesn't have a, you know, a stellar future looking ahead? Would the sentence be the same on the facts as they were in this case? It's important to note that case, Judge Aaron. So that was uh, um, that case. Um, what the reason that this case got my attention because both of my daughters, uh, my older daughter has graduated from college and my younger daughter uh, is in high school. Both of them have been and continue, one of them continue to be swimmer. And this really stirred up a huge, huge d debate in the swimming community where I'm an official because we, it was 2015, this, uh, this person, right, committed this heinous crime and tried to rape this unconscious young woman, was convicted, only got six months, and eventually he only received um, community service, right, because the judge felt that, well, he got kicked out of uh, Stanford, and that was really bad, now he had no future, and he was a swimming st uh, star, a uh, swimmer, and he was a 2016 Olympic hopeful, and his future has been destroyed, and we shouldn't give him too much harsh sentence. But just imagine in your mind, if this were a black man, if this were a Latino man, right? So automatically, if you're being just white, you have had the benefit of the doubt, the positive character. I just couldn't believe that, right? Abdu, can you still see the slides? Good, okay, thank you. So because of these- Oh wait, no, I'm sorry. We see, um, it looks like your blackboard screen maybe, but not the PowerPoint slides. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, thank you, Abdu. So let me share again. Sorry, I'm not good using the Zoom. I usually use Google Meet. Are we good now? Awesome. Sorry, I just want to go back and say that, you know, uh, the powerful of the power of the benefit of the doubt is usually granted to people who are white. And, and it stirred up that case, stirred up a lot of debate in the swimming world because the swimming world is very white, but I think I'm glad that um, you know many officials now we have we have to receive the diversity training. So I think that we also have um, uh, you know people of color joining the swimming world. So I think that I'm glad that you know we we started that debate. So I just bring this case to your attention. All right, so let's move on and um, so. White privilege, right? Because of the power of the normal and the power of the benefit of the doubt. And that lead to accumulated pa power that, uh, that will lead to the power of accumulated power. So power is being built on power. That's basically what it is, right? So this are the results of systemic racism because it allows for constant recreation of racial inequality, right? So that leads to accumulated power. Now, I found this very, you know, very good analogy about the connection between this racial inequality, racism and white privilege from uh, Corey Collins, who is a uh, senior writer for Teaching Tolerance. 
So this is how he described white privilege and racism. Quote, racism is the rain that populates the earth, giving some areas more access to life and resources than others. The evaporation is white privilege, an invisible phenomenon that is both a result of the rain and the reason it keeps going. So I thought this really, you know, it gives us a very good picture of how privilege, white privilege and racism goes hand in, go hand in hand. So what is racism? I know that, you know, uh, especially in today's world, oftentimes that uh, people don't like to talk about race and it seems like something like a taboo, right? If you say that, oh, you know, so-and-so is so bad racist, oh, that's an insult, right? Um, but I think that oftentimes people misunderstand racism is not just about individuals, right? Individuals, uh, individual racist, absolutely. We see that, but that's not as bad as, you know, racism, because we'll talk about what is racism. That's harder to see, harder to change. Right? So uh, sociologist William Julius Wilson defines racism as a principle of social domination. So it's an ideology of social domination in which a group that is seen as inferior or different because of presumed biological or cultural characteristics is oppressed, controlled, and exploited socially, economically, culturally, politically, or psychologically by a dominant group. So as you can see that racism, it's not about individuals, but it's about an ideology that creates the social domination of the, you know, the powerful against the dominated group. And race scholar Dave Wellman summarizes racism as quote, a system of advantage based on race. Now, when we say racism privileges white, does not mean that individual white people do not struggle or face barriers. It does mean that whites do not face the kind of barriers of racism. For example, poor white people, right? And I remember every time when we talk about racism, right? People will say that, well, what about, you know, white people also, they're poor, right? They, they also live in poverty, right? We cannot forget about them. Absolutely, we cannot forget about them. They also experience discrimination, right? But they don't experience racism. That's a different thing. Look, give me one, let me give you one example. This is a story that I heard on NPR. So this young woman talked about her experience of being poor, growing up poor, because she lived in a low income household, single mom, no health insurance, no dental insurance. So growing up, she never had any, any, any uh, dental, um, you know, dental treatment. And she actually had a, a broken tooth. And so she says she was always, always conscious about not smiling because she didn't want people to see her teeth. But she never imagined once that would, that would affect her job uh, search. So she had been looking for job after job after job, right? On the paper, she always looked good because despite living in poverty, growing up in poverty, she managed to attend local community college learn some skills, right? So she sent out her resume and she, she wrote, she writes pretty well and she usually will get a job interview. And but time and time again, after the job interview, the job offer just evaporated, right? And no job offer will come to her. 
until one time that her friend uh, recommended yeah. that you know she tried this company where her friend worked. So she did the same thing, you know, go through the same pro same process. Now she was at the final interview. Everything went pretty well, and the employers. The HR manager, the interviewers, pretty happy with her. So at the end, they were relaxed, they were joking, they were cracking jokes, and she was really happy. And so there was a very good vibe in the room. She felt very relaxed. She laughed a few times. And then she noticed something. The room temperature dropped slowly. And she realized something. She didn't know what went wrong, right? Did she laugh too hard? Did she crack some bad jokes? She couldn't figure it out. And so she had a bad feeling that she may not get the job again. And sure, she did not get the job offer. Now this time, because the job was from, you know, recommended from her friend. So she asked her friend to find out. And so her friend went to the HR and say, hey, I thought that she was pretty good. You know, uh, that's why I recommended that she tried our company. And the HR staff, ask her, oh my God, do you notice a tooth? Do you notice that her missing tooth? She said, is that all it's about, right? So this young woman talked about growing up poor and she's white, right? But just because she's poor, she experienced discrimination, but that's different, right? It's not based on race, but based on her social economic status. Because racism is deeply embedded historical system of institutional power of whites over people of color. It is not fluid and does not change easily because a few individual people of color managed to succeed, right? We even elected the first black president, right? Regardless of that, this structure is still there and the system remains, even though changes slowly with some legislations over time. But we saw that, you know, majority and most of the people occupying the institutions are still white. So this is what sociologists call it institutional racism because institutional racism is the complex and cumulative pattern of racial advantage and disadvantage built into the structure of a society. It is a system of power and privilege that gives the advantage to some groups over others. My specialty, as I mentioned, is in immigration. But over the years, I've taught many courses in sociology. I've done some research. So now I also know pretty well in some of the institutions, such as education, right? Such as healthcare, right? So when you think about this institutional racism or structural racism, by looking at our educational system, and in this institution, you know, structural um, racist society, we see that our students still attended pretty racially segregated schools. Well, just take New York City as an example. New York City is a very diverse city, but you think about the five boroughs, right? Children still attend school with other children who look pretty much like them. Right. If you want to make it to the top high schools in New York City, right, and it's a struggle because in order to go to the top high school, such as Stuyvesant High School, you only need to take one test. And that one test determines whether you can enter the high school, the elite high school in New York City, which paved the way to elite prestigious universities, right? And to prepare the children to enter that 
prestigious high school. Many wealthy families in New York City, predominantly white and many Asians, right? They start a kindergarten to prep. They have the money, the financial resources. This is accumulated power, right? Including wealth, power of wealth, right? To prepare the children to enter, enter the, to take, to suc successfully um, take this exam and get into Stuyvesant, eventually, you know, go on to uh, prestigious universities. Take healthcare, another institution. This pandemic, even though you don't know much about healthcare, right? But I'm sure that if you listen to news and you hear that, who get hit the hardest? The black and brown people, right? Why? Because of lack of quality care. Many of them work in jobs that don't have health coverage, medical coverage. Institutional racism, it's built into that system. The kind of job that they get tend to be small business that don't have um, medical coverage. They cannot afford to cover their employees. Some of them, they work part-time. They need multiple part-time jobs, right? So that is a very significant example of that racism being built into the system. And as a result of that, we see more of the black and brown people got hit by, by COVID-19 and die from COVID-19, right? Because we don't have universal health care, unlike other countries, many other industrialized countries. Regardless how wealthy, how poor you are, you are covered, but not us. Our healthcare system is built on the principle of fee for service. Healthcare is not treated as a, per, a human rights, but a privilege. So if you don't call that institutional racism, I don't know what you call it, right? And my, my colleagues know other institutions such as criminal justice. I don't claim to be the scholar there. So I'm not gonna to touch that. I know a little bit, but I primarily look at when my students debate me that there's no widespread systemic racism. I ask them to look at schools. I ask them to look at healthcare, right? There's two major institutions that keep people healthy, that pave the way for people to get out of poverty and become successful to achieve the American dreams, right? That's being blocked. Just like the picture, the little cartoon shows here, all the barriers put in, invisible, right? You can't afford to go to good school, a good school district. Sorry, you don't get to go to college. And then sorry, you don't get a good job. And sorry, you live in poverty. It's cumulative, right? That's institutional racism. Now, more dangerously, when we come, to, when we talk about institutional racism, it's colorblind racism, right? Because colorblind racism is invisible. It's this invisibility of racial privilege of dominant group. I use the same example here because it's a belief that what race should not be talked about, should be ignored, right? But do we really, can we really ignore the people of color when we see them, right? It's interesting that when I start my, my semester, I ask students, what does race mean to you? What does race mean to you? And there's a clear divide, right? People, students of color tend to say, race means a lot because I can see that with different skin color, get treated differently. And interestingly to my white students, I don't blame them. You know, it's really relying on the lived experience. If you don't have the lived experience, you need to have close friends who share with you their lived experience of what they go through. But to my white students, oftentimes they said, I don't see race. I treat everybody the same, right? That is colorblind racism. We can educate people about white color, I mean, colorblind racism, 
But I think that if we don't talk about it, we tend to kind of shuffle the uh, uh, racism under the rug. So I want to ask you a few questions that when we come back, right, to talk, to focus more on these questions, are people colorblind? What does a colorblind society mean for different groups in the United States, right? Clearly in my, in my class, small, just 30 students, you see the differences, right? Students of color and white students share very stark contrast view about whether we can see color or not. Another question I ask my students is that, is it possible that people are colorblind in a society that remains stratified and segregated? Some of my students say it really, really beautifully. What they are saying is that if we don't see color, we don't see the color of people, that means we don't want to acknowledge the suffering they go through. Their experience does not matter. I thought that was very powerful. In conclusion, right, privilege blinds us to systemic barriers for those who do not possess a certain privilege. Therefore, creating or perpetuating inequity based on race. That's the end of my presentation. Abdu, what do I do? Uh, nothing at this point. Thank you so much. <laughs> nothing. I'm done. <laughs> um, thanks again for, uh, to Professor Chai for that wonderful presentation. Um, so, th so the time right now is 7:55 or 7:56 rather. Um, so we can do, I guess, like a, I mean, if anyone has any uh, pressing or immediate questions, you know, for another few minutes, perhaps we can do that. Um, otherwise, I think that these are really good talking points for, for us to pick up on next week. So, mm -hmm. might anyone have any? Um, either pressing or questions to ask for this week since we're on the topic? Uh, Abdu, before um, people ask questions, I just want to remind everyone that I did send Abdu um, that um, short essay. It's very interesting. And um, I also sent a little uh, privilege uh, aptitude test and my students, it, it's very interesting that my students, you know, recognize some of the privilege that they did not uh, did not notice. And I had two short videos. And I, so I think that if you don't have time, and I really would like you to, um, to take a look at the, the, the privilege aptitude test to go through to see uh, what privilege you have, and also the short essay unpacking the invisible knapsack. Okay, yeah, so go ahead. That, yeah. for that reminder. And then because I can't, because we can't identify people's names based on some of the, um, I guess, handles or kind of Zoom names, um, if you all want to send send us your email address in the chat feature, that'll allow us to send out those links more readily, right? So I can take care of sending send, sending out that content um, um, by tomorrow morning. So if you can be so kind as to just put your email address in the chat, I'll make sure that we get those uh, those links, those resources by tomorrow morning. All right. So I see that some email emails are starting to come in. So thank you for that. Um, but any questions for this evening before we kind of break, if you will, and then, and then reconvene next Wednesday? I have kind of an, un well, it's sort of related, but it's not directly to the presentation. But um, I know that years ago they developed, I think it was Harvard, uh, but I might be wrong, developed something called an implicit um, racial bias test. Implicit and it was bias. something mm -hmm. you can take online and so forth. And I've done some reading on it, and I know there's a lot of, debate as to whether or not it's really very useful. But I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about that type of test. Yeah, I think that um, implicit uh, bias basically is that our society has programmed us to, uh, to, to think about, I'm trying to think when we see something and we form that, to become stereotypical. It's pretty much talk about 
how our prejudice is formed is through uh, the media, is through socialization. I'll give you one example, right? Implicit bias, let's say, right? Classic example. When I, if I say peanut butter, what comes to your mind? Jelly. Jelly. Jelly, right? So the stereotype when we uh, think about, well, because I'm Asian, so I usually make fun of myself, right? And Asians are good at, do I have many math professor here? Sociology? Oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> Asians are good at math. And, you know, like, uh, so, it, you know, my, I, I have two, I have two girls, right? I have two daughters. And then my, my older one, it's very interesting. They're, they're personality wise and then interest, everything. They're very, very different. So my, my older one is really a, a book person, really a word person. She loves words, right? And she happened to be weak in math. And she's always, she's very frustrated growing up because her math teachers throughout all K to 12, right? Always look to her and expecting her to do well. And that's her weakness. And so my daughter, we joke about it in the house and say, well, I guess I'm not Asian, I'm just Bijan. So that forms that stereotype, which it, you know, it's, it really, that become the way we see other people, the way we see us. So there's a lot of issues there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that implicit bias basically really become the foundation of um, stereotype. Well, did you have any uh, particular opinions about some of the online tests that were put together that people could take, you know, where it shows like different faces and then you click on different keys and things like that. I, uh, they were interesting, but um, I did read later that there was a lot of debate among researchers as to whether they were very indicative of what they were trying to test for but right well I think that I you know some of some of them I I'm not comfortable taking you know some of those tests there but what I oftentimes uh, think about implicit bias is that some you know when sociologists talk about um, bias and stereotype it reflects a grain of truth but not the whole truth and um, but what the danger is that it, you know, either positive or negative stereotype, right? Creates that misperception of other people and also forms that us versus other. So that is my, you know, that's my position there. But I don't like, you know, like taking the test there, but, uh, but I know some of them, they, they do come up with the test of um, how do you test your own implicit bias, mm -hmm. but that's interesting, yeah. Great, thanks for that question. Any other questions for Professor um, Chai before we um, head out for the evening? So like thank you. To thank um, Dr. Chai. Thank you for such an insightful talk. Um, she was very every good. Time we speak, um, every time you and I speak, um, I learned a lot, so I wanted to just thank you. Thank you, Elena. Yes, thank you. This was awesome. Oh, thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. It was, this was next Wednesday thank at the you. same time, right? Next so Wednesday some of those back. questions yep. that when we come so, back, I will also, um, you know, bring some other questions and. Um, then we can we can have a uh, lively chat next week. Yes, thank you. So, so the question that was posed previously, yes. Yeah, so uh, next Wednesday, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, yes. Same link, right? And then we'll, we'll we'll pick up with those questions. And for those that are remaining on the call, again, if you haven't sent send in your email address into the chat, please do so now, so that we can make sure that you all um, receive those resources from Professor Chai. All right. So I'm going to stick around here for folks to finish inputting their emails. Um, otherwise, we'll see you all next week. Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you, everybody, for coming. You. See you next week. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. So Abdu, then um,
do you want me to, so those are the things and then I also have a um, I'm going to prepare uh, 